Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wild Chats, your home for everything animals. I am Ryan, and that is Maria. <laughs> um, so yesterday we were talking about uh, animal athletes, and then we got on the uh, subject of bodybuilders and stuff, and and how sometimes you can get a little little too big, uh, which kind of uh, impedes some of the other sports and stuff that. Uh, that you may want to do, which kind of inspired me a little bit to uh, to take on today's topic, which is going to be animals that are definitely stronger than you think that they should be. Ooh, okay. Surprising, yeah. We just some feats of strength, some lifting, some athleticism. Um, but that's kind of uh, <laughs> yesterday kind of got me into this video. I was like, okay, love now, it, love it. Now I'm curious. Um, along those lines, what? is like the most amazing feat of animal strength you've ever seen. Feat of animal strength. Yes, not not Pepita pu pulling <laughs> you along with leverage on the leash like she's been known to do, as, as we've told the story in the past, with the 10-pound uh, chihuahua <laughs> just running you around. <laughs> feat of animal strength that I have encountered. Um, I went to a, um, in the Everglades, they have crocodile tours, like you go through the Everglades and the crocodile tours. Okay. And it's amazing because, yeah, you hear about crocodiles being large and everything, but when you see them jumping out of the water, you don't realize they are amazing. They're so strong and so beautiful. Like I get overwhelmed just even thinking about when they come out of the water. Like think of a whale or a, no, actually a shark. Think of a shark, how they come out of the water. Yeah. Where crocodiles can pretty much do the same thing, even mm -hmm. though it's not very common because it does take a lot of energy and it's not like they're trying to, but they do, they can jump. And I find that so amazing. Okay. Okay. Now, you, did you actually see this in person? Like we, we didn't see them like jumping like they, like when you watch a, a video and the professionals have spent hours and hours trying to capture that moment. It was more like the guy sticking out, you know. Okay. But but I, I have, I have one. so many videos. Okay. I have mm -hmm. one. So I'm gonna look Ooh. away for a second because I want to find it just so people know what you're talking about. Okay, uh, so this is great that you have a video about it. Yeah, I think crocodiles are so incredible. And I think in one of the videos we talk about crocodiles uh climbing. Yeah, you no said something about climbing trees. They do. Yeah. If they don't have rocks and stuff to rest on, they actually uh, will hang out in trees because they're trying to soak up the sun because they can't regulate their own body temperature. It's based on their environment. So if they yeah. don't have rocks or a sunny spot, they'll actually climb trees and hang they'll out find the spot. <laughs> like in the branches. Exactly. They'll they'll go find a spot. Exactly. Um, I, I used to be so afraid of crocodiles. And still I am. Of course I am. But they are so smart they will literally so when we talk about strength think of also the mental strength and the memory strength when you think of strength of memory you think of an elephant but when you think of hunting skills that that's one of the reasons why these guys have been forever and ever in our planet they're just I know what to do to with that there. big fat look at this <laughs> yeah no, they they definitely uh they definitely can get some some distance. <laughs> look at it, look at it, look at it, how it sticks out. Uh-huh. I mean his tail is almost completely. Uh-huh. And that's the that's actually the the technique and the strategy is it's that that wiggle that actually it's the essentially if you swim, I forget what the uh the stroke is, but like once swimmers go underwater and then they turn around and they're still underwater and you can see them kind of wiggle. It's that exact same motion that that actually propels. No, interestingly more. enough, that wiggle will be more like a dolphin. This is a side wiggle. So if you look oh. at them, side wiggle like sharks also side wiggle too. Okay. Uh, they don't they don't do this motion. This will be a dolphin motion. Yep. Yeah. I'm doing, I'm doing the snake. I am. But it's. <laughs> <laughs> this will be more of a fish. <laughs> okay, so now we have uh, switched. We're not going to do strongest animals today, uh, everybody. We are just going to watch thirty minutes of Maria break dancing. Go ahead, Maria, go. Go wiggle, wiggle, eat drops, be I don't even know that song. <laughs> okay then. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. 
I've been drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have coffee. I should be drinking that. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, I looked over. I was like, I'm going to take coffee. Wait, no, I don't, want, I don't want people to see it. And then I'm like, no, forget it. I want coffee. <laughs> I always select my cups based on how I feel that day or what I think should come up. I don't know why, honestly, but I love them. Hand painted. Okay. Yeah, I like my beverage to match the glass. So I've, I've got a color cavalcade of like 25 glasses of different varying shades. So it perfectly matches the liquid in it. But I'm, no, I would no, I would never do that. <laughs> I do. I have different cups. They're like, I love tea. So to me, having different tea cups or mugs, in this case, is a mug. It just makes me happy. Okay. Okay. I just happen to have a round cup, so I just decided to roll with it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it matches your uh, doors. <clears throat> yeah, side. exactly. Exactly. I get a, It's a brown theme going on. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty... Some animals are pretty impressive. Like, have you... It, it was an internet hoax, basically, or, or whatever, a deep fake, if you want to call it, but the video of the uh, the eagle or whatever it was picking up the baby and like at a park and then flying away with the baby have you seen oh, the video God. or heard the story i think i've heard of it but there okay. have been so many movies also that have kind of taken on that theme that's a good uh, point so there's like oh okay yeah but yeah i wouldn't be surprised honestly if an eagle could pick up a very tiny baby i wouldn't expect a big like even pepita i mean she's a hefty close to a 10 pounder <laughs> um double digits girl double digits <laughs> she's not there yet she's that i hope she never gets there but she should be like seven yeah. anyway the point is she will be easily picked up and that's one of the things i kept telling my mom like mom if you're gonna walk pepita keep an eye don't let her lose because you just don't know who's you know we have falcons yeah and exactly eagles. and there's some very big birds of prey and raptors Ostrich. and stuff but mm -hmm. what surprised me is that like a, you don't realize how big their wingspans are. Like some of these birds and birds of prey and raptors are actually really, really big animals. And if you if you haven't seen them in person, you're like, oh, they're big. You're like, no, no, they're like ginormous. But this video was just so impressive to me because that is uh, that is not a tiny animal that he's circling, and he's not trying to like steal a mouse in front of. Uh, I think it's like a, a goat of some sort. Um, yeah, like a mountain goat. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he's he's gonna he's he's not trying to catch something in front of the goat. No, he's gonna take the entire goat. Are you kidding me? Like yep. seriously? Yeah. No. But look no, at his wingspan. No. Look, he's actually no. bigger than that goat. Oh my god! I have look at the other guys. Like, what's going on, Paul? Uh -huh. What's going on, and Paul? Apparently. What they do is they basically drop them off cliffs. They can't quite pick them up, but they drop them off the cliffs and basically. But yeah, he basically. I see rides what you're saying. It's not about lifting them up. It's because they need them. They need hunting. They need to to. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the eagle lost that one. I don't know. He still oh. got his talons locked into him, and the other guy can't do anything about it. This is is not a mountain goat. I don't know what critter, what kind of goat it is, but oh my gosh, oh yeah. my gosh, this is like like amazing and stressing me out because look at the feathers flying. So it's a goat, and it's called a C H A M O I S chamoy. It's a chamoy goat, and oh, it's a mountain. Oh my gosh! So typically, what happens in the scenario, though, I guess, is the bird comes in. And it's able to pick the goat up just enough. And you can see that here where he kind of keeps getting them off the ground just a little as they go down the hill. But what the goal is for the bird is to actually get him to a cliff. So yeah, he can then lift him enough and then drop him off the cliff. And then the goat falls and dies. And then he's got his meal. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's mm. the part that is this, like, I'm... If you guys don't didn't realize how durable some of these birds were, there you go. He just had a goat roll over him and slam him into a rock, and he's still going. But uh, feathers, oh my gosh! Like this is better than a rodeo. Look at that. Uh huh. But this is a uh, perfectly good example of animals that are much stronger than you realize they are. I would have never, ever, ever in my life. 
uh uh consider something like this could happen like this yeah, is just you're like oh a very young. small baby or papita or something we're thinking like 10 or 12 pounds that goat's got to be over 50 pounds that's bigger than a dog for sure and he's not picking him up and flying away with him but you can see them leave the ground and he but flies that's a very for- interesting that's a very amazing hunting strategy that they have developed because they mm-hmm. know the size of the animal is much bigger than they are it's impossible that an eagle will be able to to carry it on. But what they need is the food source. They yeah. don't need to take it home. They just need to eat. And what they can do is if uh, the other male or female, because I don't know if that was a male or a female, um, if they have babies, then they can just, you know, go back and forth with pieces of meat for the babies. And that's yeah, actually a but... way more practical way of doing it mm-hmm. than grabbing your cat, which there have been cases. I think oh, you yeah. sent me a video of that. What's that? Somebody, somebody sent me a video of a um, of a cat. It was a it's a it was a cam like a wildlife cam that they had put on these particular eagles nest. Okay. And uh, it literally was a house cat. Okay. Right there. So. Oh, some like were... a, a bird picked up a house cat. Yeah, the eagle yeah. picked up the house cat, and off there was dinner. A fluffy uh, yeah. was dinner. After seeing this, like I now I'm like, okay, we're not talking 10 pounds. Like you got the right bird of prey and 20 pounds is easily like pick up and fly away weights depending on. I am so like, it's, it's so overwhelming how beautiful that was. And the interaction with, Mm -hmm. with the strength of the animal and the beak. And to me, that was just fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So the interesting, one of the other interesting things, so I I started kind of researching because that's what kind of got me interested when I saw the clip. I was like, how much can these guys lift or what, you know, what? And as I started poking around to see kind of what animals they hunt for and what kind of weights they can lift, I came across this really interesting article. And apparently the Dutch National Police have taken this, this tendency of eagles to just snatch stuff. And they've actually trained a troop of bald eagles to like patrol their airspace so if there's mini drones in their airspace they've trained the eagles to actually snatch the drones no way yep and take them basically away i don't don't know where they've trained them like i'm sure it's a you know storage area or something but the eagles will snatch the drones out of the sky as a defensive measure for drones i love that i love that 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 is incredible because you're also taking the the strength and the hunting skill of an animal Uh and of course anything and everything with respect and and for the animal because you're now literally saying the animal is not a free animal but you're also giving them a job and an opportunity to to maybe even perhaps continue expanding with the breed and and breeding Mm -hmm. programs that will allow for that particular eagle to be stable so Looking at it from the conservation side, mm-hmm. it could be, I mean, most people will be like, oh my gosh, you're taking wild animals. But if they are becoming endangered and you can keep them and save and promote their reproduction, yeah. perhaps it's not a bad thing. Yeah. And I don't know too much about the the bald eagle populations in, in the Netherlands and stuff. I mean, we think bald eagle, obviously we always think of the United States, but they, they were a bald eagle group that they were training in the Netherlands to do that. So I was like, oh, that's interesting. They could also I, I be never... an imported animal. I mean, they could be just not a species that is natu- native to the area. Yeah. I, I don't know about bald eagles, but one thing I do tell you, when you go to Alaska, go zip lining or hiking through the fjords and everything. And when I went there, it was amazing. We were zip lining and you see bald eagles everywhere. You will mm-hmm. think they are just like I don't know seagulls. That's how how prevalent. Yeah. They are. Wow. Nice. Yeah, mm-hmm. the bird species. Right. There's so many different like bird species packs and stuff in in those regions because there's so few humans there. It's one of the few areas they can still take over an entire island and and not be bothered or shoot away or someone exactly. wants to build a house or. Uh, yeah, it's it is interesting. It, it just, it's just fascinating how how what we think is uh, stinked in one area is extremely prevalent in another. And bald eagles there are everywhere, everywhere. 
Yeah, you just have to, it, it's not an eagle thing, but you just have to be so careful with invasive species because you just don't realize the impact that I was reading an article a couple days ago about, I guess, every year in Florida, they do like the, the big python hunt and they yes. actually like license people. And it's I think it's happening right now. Okay. Um, but they basically license people and, and, you know, whoever catches the biggest one or the most of them and stuff. But it's just so necessary because they were, as part of the article, they were talking about the hunt, but then they were, you know, interviewing people that had lived in the area for a really long time. And one lady was talking about how she's like, I, when I was a kid, I would see rabbits and, and all these different types of animals all over the wetlands and the yeah, Everglades. And, and now there's, there's basically hardly any of them because of all the snakes that have taken over. Um, so. Yeah. We talked a little bit about that in our alligator video, how invasive species can really cause havoc in, in special uh, mm -hmm. especially uh the snakes in florida and the pythons and it is it is a big problem now we're having um these tiny 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 snakes they're called blind snakes they were supposed to be pets okay. and they look i don't even have anything here on my desk that i could point think of a tiny string of, of a metal wire like a okay. tiny tiny metal wire one of those tiny copper metal wires mm -hmm. that's how thin they are and they don't have a, a face they look they literally look like little round balls okay like very long with little round edges and they're called blind snakes and apparently they escape from somebody's uh terrarium which of uh -huh. course i'm sure they would because they're so small yeah they definitely would they're that small so interesting interesting yeah florida anytime you look up uh invasive species and like lists of invasive species it's usually like a whole bunch of things in florida and like the lionfish and then some more stuff in florida i don't know what it is about florida and everybody letting the invasive species go but the interesting thing about some of the eagles too is they use those say talons and stuff like i think you had done a video on this on on the other stuff that you had worked on about the vegetarian eagles no uh vegetarian piranhas no, but the, okay, well, there's vegetarian eagles also. So things okay. that you would yeah, not think. I think it was, was vultures? Was it they're vultures? They're like palm, yeah, they're palm nut vultures. And they actually like for the nuts and the palm trees and stuff and the yeah. palm oil. And they, mm -hmm. they use that same beak and strategy to like crack open and dropping and stuff to open up the uh, the seeds and the yeah, nuts. Yeah, it was vultures, like I that. remember. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> it just, and then even talking about vegetarian piranhas, who in the right mind will think that they will be vegetarian piranhas <laughs> and it's amazing because they are much larger like they're humongous they're very dark dark on black yeah colors. they don't look like what you would think of as a piranha yeah and they're big because piranhas actually if you look at a piranha they're the length of a phone a piranha um but they're actually much larger much much mm -hmm. larger and uh they travel miles and miles further away to to feed so they end up actually fertilizing and spreading seeds all over the place. So yeah, they're they eat. one of the most important species in the Amazon. But what was the story though? Like the, the fruit seeds fall from the trees lining the, the river and that's what they eat inside the river. And then they like spread that around as they eat. Was that the deal? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Like bats do. I mean, that's one of the reasons why bats are also so predominant because the soil, when people think of the Amazon rainforest, they really think, oh, it's fertile, luscious, and just anything will grow. That's actually not true. It's a very thin layer of good, fertile soil. Mm -hmm. So when they do deforestation, it's not that easy for the soil to, to go back and grow into a, tr into, a, into a stable forest. It's actually not that simple. So mm -hmm. when they, the deforestation is actually a big problem, and these... Um, uh, piranhas spread the seeds because also different seasons the base of the of the river the amazon basin actually overflows everywhere mm -hmm. so therefore they spread seeds better at different locations oh okay it's okay a very fragile ecosystem yeah and i think uh which is actually a really good kind of uh segue because the next animal that i wanted to talk about was actually the um and everybody tells you how strong an ant is just because of their size relative to mm -hmm. what they can carry. But the leaf cutter ants are actually, they can carry stuff that's like 50 times their body weight. And they, they live in exactly those environments in the Amazon stuff that you're talking about. And they cut the leaves and then those leaves are made 
to not only make their home, but they use the uh, the juice and the leaves as basically a glucose like energy source. Um, yes. But oh, I wish I had known. I had the best video about that that I recorded. Oh yeah. Well, I got a video I too. Will. Yeah, I got a video. <laughs> you actually have a very nice video. Look at that. Yeah, it's but this is what we're talking about here is lifting that head? leaf and that stalk compared to that ant size. But it's just gorgeous too, the way that they're able to just go along the forest floor and collect all these pieces to make their nests and it's food and are those seafood ants also? No, no, those are the seafood ants are the uh those are the biting ants, right? You're right. Those are the carnivorous. You're right. Yeah. They're carnivorous. Yeah, like they will eat you. Yeah, you do not want to run into seafood ants. Is that the ones that the uh, traditional Amazon tribes use for the the um the glove for the kids coming of age ceremony? Are those seafood ants also? Yeah. So basically they like they have a glove and they line it with these like ants that have one of the most painful bites on the planet. And then the kid has to put his hand in it and like withstand the bites to kind of show his manhood. And that's uh yes, yeah. That just the no thought thing. of that. Oof, <laughs> no, <awful>. thank you. <laughs> Let's die here. Tourist <laughs> attractions I will pass on. Ants in a glove biting me. No, thank you. I'm good. <laughs> but actually, it's very interesting because different tribes, the Amazon, um, it's a cacophony of, of different tribes and cultures. And yeah. the, the Amazon from Brazil is very different than the Amazon. It's different, but it's not because to them, there is no borderline. They don't, they don't care if yeah. you're crossing Peru or if you're crossing, you know, they don't that's not relative to them or relevant to them. But yet there are a lot of tribes around. And if you ever have a chance to go to the Amazon, it's so beautiful. So well, and beautiful. I don't think people realize how long that river really is. I mean, you're talking about cultures popping up and I don't know the relative size, but if there was a river that went from some part of the Western U S to like Texas, you would, yeah, you're going to get different cultures because that's a large span of area. Yeah, you all live on the same river, but yeah, you're going to develop different histories and cultures and traditions and stuff. Just because you happen to be under this on the same river under the same set of plants doesn't mean that you're going to evolve the same way in the strain. And also because the distance, as you said, is so far and dif and because it's traveling by foot. So they may do exchange of uh, trading Mm -hmm. maybe, but, but that's probably as far as, as, um, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, so your influence team. doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But if you ever go the, you will be amazed by the pink dolphins. There's not many of those left though. Right. That they're no, super. I, went there, I could barely see them and they are endangered. There are a lot of organizations that are working on allowing these beautiful animals to, to be able to continue growing. But also just, again, deforestation is a huge problem. And how can you blame a village when they're starving and they need food? They're not thinking about, oh, we need to protect the forest. They're thinking about, we need to protect our family. So, yeah, and I, I think that's an interesting point too, because that it's an issue for everybody, no matter if you're a tribe in a forest or sometimes that is the decision you have to make in life. And as much as it's, it's important to conserve and take care of animals and, and protect habitats and stuff like that, Sometimes in life, you you just that choice comes down to, do I take care of my family or do I? And yeah, I mean, it's it's such a hard, nothing's black and white, nothing's cut and dry. And it seems like so often when you read an article or someone speaks on a topic, they're coming from a very strong point of view on one side or the other. And it's really, yeah. that stuff's really hard for me to listen to sometimes or even read because it's like, it's not black and white. It's not that easy. There's stuff in the middle. There's things you're not considering. You're not offering perspectives and understanding. So I think that's one of the other reasons too, that you and I get along really well when we talk about animals and stuff is sometimes our perspectives are a little different. Some, you know, I prioritize things that you maybe don't as much, um, but it's being able to hear it and listen and take in perspectives or read articles exactly. and be open to, Ooh, I hadn't considered that. Um, so I think that's, that's part of the fun though. I, I really do enjoy that. And the perspectives of, of caring, honestly, that's all we want is caring. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I was working. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting an organization in Florida who works with the crocodilians around mm -hmm. the world. And I'm like, how are you 
How are you working with the people, the, the culture to, to protect this animal? How are you selling it mm -hmm. to a family who is in the brink of a starvation to protect a crocodile? And they're like, well, we're working with the communities and we're actually providing a source of income to take care of the animal. So to them, taking care of the animal becomes actually a source of income. So it was a way of really truly caring about the community while truly caring about the, the environment. And I was so pleased to hear yeah. that, that they were working with organizations, with the government, because also there has to be regulation. There has to be a form to regulate, but yeah. also protect the culture and protect the environment. They, they could always be a middle ground. And I was very pleased when I was talking to these people that they were working on that exact mission. Yeah, I, I think more parts of the world are starting to come around to that concept. Um, even in the US, they just passed a, a bill recently, but it's it was for protection of environments and species. And, and it wasn't, and it passed with like, which is rare, but with like agreement from both sides. But it was because people are starting to realize that you make money off this stuff. Like it's- yeah. It's okay. You can take whatever side you want. Some people want the animals and the environment, but other people realize that there's an income source to it. And once those two things come together, that's where you get to where you probably need to be because Africa kind of figured it out first with all the safaris and all the conservation and villages that basically started stuff like that. Then that became that tourism dollar and people want to come see mm -hmm. this. People like to see rare things. You go to Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon and they want to see things they can't see in other places. So by mm -hmm. conserving these areas and these animals, no matter what your perspective is on it, it's good business also. And people it's are finally not. starting to come around to realize that. And now you're getting both sides coming together going, well, I want it for this reason. You want it for that reason, but we both want it. So let's do exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. I love that. I love that because honestly, when I went to the Amazon rainforest, we went through an organization that, yeah, it's a hotel magnate. They have their own charters and they do all kinds of things. But the cool thing was that where they made the hotel, they conserved most of the, like, they just literally just made the hotel tiny space. There's not like mm -hmm. extra playgrounds and yeah. pools, nothing of that sort. It really was just very close to the Amazon basin up in stilts because the 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 A river yeah. changes and flooding mm -hmm. and stuff like that but they made sure to keep it as tight and respected the animals and somebody was actually telling me that at night they heard this screaming like a creditor screaming well they turned the light on and it was a snake chasing a big mouse <laughs> in their room and, <laughs> and they heard and and somebody was walking by and they heard them like like overexcited, not screams from the people, but they heard the, the voices. So when they opened the door, the, the one of the uh, hotel people was there and they're like, okay, we will remove the animal, but we have to wait for the snake to finish digesting the, uh, the rabbit or at least swallow mm -hmm. it. So not to intervene yeah. in the hunting yeah. progress. And I was like, oh, why mm -hmm. wasn't that in my room? Why so, was not yeah. that in my room? Now it's on the marketing flyer, though. Like, if you'd like to live a real-life Disney experience watching animals chase each other around like a cartoon, come to our resort. <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful because also they worked with, with, the, with the community. So they mm -hmm. took us to the different communities to meet the different tribes. And, and of course, that produces a source of income for them. Yeah, So they had exactly. their, their little village and they walked us around. So we went onto the forest with them and they were explaining to us the different plants and fruits and mm -hmm. the uses of them. And then you had the shaman there and it was just so much fun. It yeah. was such a pleasure that I got out of going there, knowing that not only was I getting the experience, they were also benefiting from it. So their mm -hmm. community could benefit yeah. and they had a show and they were telling us about their tribes. And we went to like four different tribes mm -hmm. and experienced just their their way of doing things and gotcha. super worth it, super worth oh, it. Oh yeah. No, it's, I, I think it's fantastic that they're, and it's such a fine line to walk too. Cause like, you feel like you go to Hawaii and they do the whole like, 
pig in the ground fire show. And you're like, this is not culturally relevant whatsoever. This is just literally a show put on for tourists. And I don't think they like spin sticks of fire around when they're hanging out in the village. <laughs> I mean, there's yeah, that. But like the Maori tribe, uh, that was the way they did their cooking. So the pig. No, the no and I don't, I'm not disagreeing with like, how they cook the pig, but it's like, obviously the show is a show. Like there's just, there's certain islands, uh, like off of Colombia, as you're going North to Panama, there's like islands that there's only one way to cross. Cause you can't go through the Darien gap. So somebody set up a boat tour where basically you leave from Colombia and then you kind of go into the Caribbean and then you come back to Panama and the Island that you go to is an indigenous Island. And, but the problem is that it's most of their income is from that. And over time, they cater more and more to the tourists and it gets slightly further away from the actual culture or the items they can sell. Or it, So it started off a certain way and an idea. And then sometimes I think, and then you look at places in the United States, like Hawaii, where it's just, it's developed into just, it's a show for the tourists. Like there's not, yeah, and I don't have an opinion on it one way or another, it, like, but that's just an evolution of kind of how yeah. that type of tourism can go. Um, but the thing is, Unfortunately, if you want to go explore the world, you're going to have to get a sort of uh, infrastructure. And that's also part of the strength of the community. So going back to yeah. like unexpected strength, um, I think feeling safe. Like I went to another area of Colombia and um, I was perplexed. Like I will never want to go back there. Environmentally, okay. a mess. And I'm talking to the people that I'm like, why are these tribes not keeping their place clean? They were trash bags everywhere and when i say everywhere like in the distance i'm looking at a tree and i'm thinking wow that tree is absolutely gorgeous oh no it was trash bags hanging off the tree but in the distance it looked like a like a lot of beautiful i don't know a cacophony of beautifulness so and as good, as I good got from far it, far from good far far <laughs> like i will I, I'm, not, I'm talking to them i'm thinking like how can we cater then to you can make money if you clean this area. Yeah. And you can also protect the, the ocean because the ocean was right there. And I was just, I was so shocked. And I talked to them. They're like, oh, it's just the culture. Unfortunately, the people who live here, they have done, um, the government has done a lot of programs for yeah. cleaning. And it's just not done um, like that's it. I want to go back to ocean since you got us there and uh, actually because <laughs> we're, we're half hour in and we've, we've barely got on topic here. <laughs> I'm trying to turn it into the strength of our culture, but these mantis uh, shrimp is, is it a mantis shrimp? It's a, yeah. So strongest animal strength to weight ratio uh, on the planet. Um, and that punch is actually one of like the fastest moving punches like on or and the amount of damage it can do as you can see it starts chipping away at the actual like that's a clam like that's a living clam not a been out in the sun fragile shell clam and that's the amount of and they're damage strong. they're strong yeah. the, their muscles yeah yeah really actually really their strong. punch is so strong that if they don't like if, even if they don't hit you the the strength of the punch is so is such so much that they actually get hot. Like the so water this gets will, hot around them. This will be one Maria is going to have a hard time with, guys, because she never knows who to root for. But this uh, this unfortunate crab has, has ran into this mantis shrimp. And uh, for the most part, normally a crab doesn't have to worry about anything because their shells are so thick. Uh, but when you run into That's a mantis an aquarium. shrimp... That's an aquarium. Yeah, we it got dropped in. You, you can see at the beginning, somebody dropped it in there, unfortunately. Um, I mean, we have to understand, and I have to tell this to myself all the time. It is the circle of life. I mean, the Lion King said it best. It is the circle of life, uh, and you just don't know who it's... I mean, the, there is a beautiful balance between predator and prey, and and actually, but the there was crab a doesn't that... leave. It's like you just got beat up on and you stay. No, but that's right a different outside. one. That's a different clam. It is. So it's, I kind of fast forward it because it's a long, yeah. <laughs> that's a pistol shrimp. I don't know how the pistol shrimp got mixed into here. Oh, that's why. 
<laughs> oh, he just he just pops out of his cave and hits the dude in the face, basically. Look, did you see that? Hey, <laughs> get away. Get away from my cave. <laughs> that was, uh, but did you notice that he did it more out of get out of my way than yeah. I want to kiss you? Yeah. Yeah. It was just that get out of here. <laughs> I tell you, um, so I was saying something about a TV show that was called Prey, Prey versus uh, Pre uh, Predator versus Prey, uh -huh. and they put up the stats like like if it was a um, uh, like a football player or uh, yeah. just yeah. showing you the stats, mm -hmm. and it was incredible how strong the predator and the prey are in their own areas. Mm -hmm. Usually, the predator, of course, ends up winning, but not all the time. I mean, we ooh. do you see what he did? Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's the part I want to do. Because it is a better battle to lose an arm that they can grow again than it is to, to, to completely die. But if you know that the animal you're up against is that strong, why would you just, like, we come back back to here where he's still hanging out outside of his cave. It's like, all right, but well, you got away. Way. Why are you still hanging out? <laughs> I mean... Also because it, yeah, I don't. I don't know I, why. He must that really want person. that cave. Well, also remember that if that's a tank, there may only be one cave. That's a good point, but still, go. I mean, like, I don't know. Like, something was thumping on me like that. I'd find somewhere else to be if it was me, especially when, like I said, that that is the strongest uh, strength to weight ratio in the entire animal kingdom. Not that that crab knows that, but I'm sure he feels it when he gets hit. But if you notice in that particular scene that you just showed, and this one as well, that crab is the the mantis shrimp is actually doing it to protect its cave. Yeah. The other one was a hunting, like there was a yeah, because he takes the arm and actually pulls it into the cave to eat. Exactly. Yes, but but the, but the, the hunting strategy is very different than the protection strategy, of course. And it's that's just, why I wanted to show the different clips with different animals. That's that's a fantastic point. Woof. You can hear the. Uh huh. I've, I've got the audio turned down. If you wanna, like, you hear the thump when it hits the shell. But you know that also they release. Now he's, they release he's thumping it to open it up and eat. Wow. But, but yeah. that's a different shrimp. That's a different, I mean, a different crab. Yeah. He lost mm -hmm. an arm too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're better off losing an arm than losing their life because at mm -hmm. least they feed the animal. Um, but in some of those, they, they actually have been known to break glass. They're not the best pet to have at all. They will break a glass. They're that strong. Yeah, no, they definitely can. I just, I don't think there's ever a lot of motivation to do it. I don't, there's not a... Usually when they're thumping, it's like you said, it's for protection or for hunting or something like that. Now, if there's something on the other side of the glass kind of teasing it, maybe if there's like a cat tapping on the glass, you've got another pet in the house. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. If, and speaking of that, it's very interesting because not almost very few animals are, you're never going to domesticate a fox, but the fox learns fast enough how to please you, but you never really domesticate a fox. And, and what does he say, though? When you try party? to domesticate them? When you try to no, domesticate them? No, according to research, you really don't. You, they oh, learn I'm, stuff. He's trying to make a what-the-fuck-day to... joke. You, didn't, you <laughs> just totally skip right past it because you were trying to teach Maria. This is Maria in a... teacher mode. <laughs> 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 trying to have a little levity here with some what-the-fuck-day jokes, and you're just moving right on along. <laughs> what does the fox say? <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Back to teaching. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I forgot my train of thought, but there are very few animals who are actually domesticated, truly domesticated. Yeah. Uh, most animals literally just kind of get used to their fate. But there are yeah. some animals that their strength is to completely, completely surrender. Yeah. That's their strength. And mm -hmm. those in the top of my list of strengths, unexpected strengths, would be the pelicans. Okay. Pelicans are, they go diving to, to get their fish. They yeah. also will wait for somebody else, like a comrades or in Hingas okay. who are hunting. 
they wait for them to grab the fish and they literally will bully them to let the fish go. So they Yeah, why them. do the work if you don't have to? Yes, they're really bad. Like the white pelicans who travel around, uh, you get some of those in Florida. They are gigantic. They're like two, three times larger than a regular pelican. So when you were showing the eagle, uh, it was like an eagle, wasn't it? Yeah. I think um, mm -hmm. um, they're humongous. They are the gigantic. But mm -hmm. here's the here's the point I was trying to make with with their strength, is there was a rescue here in Florida that worked with it was called the Pelican Man Rescue, and they were talking about a few years ago. This is not even in. Uh, okay. But my girlfriend used to volunteer there, and she will say that the pelicans were the worst guests because they never wanted to leave. Yeah. Once they knew you were bringing free fish, and they didn't have to do anything. They stayed. Yeah. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's kind of why you have to be careful. I mean, when you bring food to campsites and then, yeah, you end up, you're not domesticating the animals because they're still wild, but then they you become part of their food chain. Not you as in eating you, but you as in you <laughs> bringing. If they know that, yeah, if I hang around this particular area of the forest, these humans come by and they bring food and I can just raid it and eat it. It's just so much easier to do that than it is to go hunt it yourself. I mean, it's they're it, not afraid of you, and that's the biggest problem. And that happens a lot in Florida too with alligators. People are like, "Oh, look, I made a friend." Ah, uh, no, you just made that alligator extremely dangerous. Yeah, like you actually made it bad. Absolutely. Yeah, and then some animals are just so. I mean, they're just so big. And so strong that they're just hard to deal with when, I mean, sometimes you have to move them around. Sometimes you don't have a choice and you've got to relocate an animal. And sometimes to the extent that you need like a massively large chain just to try to get oh this thing. Oh my God, where are you getting where that you need it to be to get it out to where you can move it? Or, oh, oh, wait, no, oh, <laughs> no, no, maybe not. No, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was so adorable <laughs> this guy is such a good actor too he's got his foot he on is. the wall <laughs> he is he's actually being very gentle to the uh -huh. animal you can see the dog is absolutely and absolutely no i just love the all. guy but when he gets so his funny. foot on the wall he's like leverage i got this hold on <laughs> The funny thing is, because he was so um, adamant about it, uh -huh. I almost had a feeling it was going to be something ridiculous because he was so adamant about it. <laughs> like you will never, ever, ever be in front of uh, an animal you're trying to pull out. Like yeah. You're never going to be in front of a cow. You should never be in front of an alligator or a tiger. Mm -hmm. Because guess what? Yeah, they may be fighting you, but... Guess what? <laughs> yeah, once they decide to change their mind and go with it, yeah, there's your Aikido again, see? They're like, thanks, you just propelled me right into you. I appreciate that. Exactly, and you lose balance, and easy peasy, just mm -hmm, like a pelican. Mm -hmm. I got I mean, food. if Pizza can leverage pull you around on a leash, maybe that tiny puppy genuinely was leverage pulling that dude around. <laughs> Did you see the size of that head? That was humongous. <laughs> I was like getting was... a clip of like that you've seen like the videos of the super muscular dogs, like the way overly developed muscular. Just for fun, I was gonna grab one of those and just kind of do like, but after some of the chain training, this is what you get. And then I just said, <laughs> but I was I was gonna go that way of like the before and after picture because man, they got some videos of some dogs that are just like ripped, and you're like, whoa. Yeah, so my girlfriend used to, um, when she had rescues at her house, there was one pit bull in particular who only like women. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if he had been abused in the past, but anyway, didn't pass the test of friendliness. They do, okay. uh, many rescues do a test just to make sure the animal is exposed to different situations to see what triggers them. This one did not like men, like at all. Okay. But you will look at him and he was... To me, it was absolutely gorgeous. He was all muscle, mm -hmm. full muscle on. Like the head was huge. The ears, unfortunately, they had cut him because when when many animals get rescued, the owners have trimmed their ears, especially if they're using them for fight. Yeah. Um, because the expression animals can read each other, and also there is something to pinch or yeah. chew on. 
but what make these animals so worth telling you about is that the way it will howl or bark sounded like a wounded seal. <laughs> it was so weird. So you see these massive dog, like full on just Goliath. Wow, absolutely beautiful. But then the howling, you're like, oh my God, is there a weird creature that we should be aware of? Is like a when Wendigo or something? Mm-hmm. Because it sounded mm-hmm. so scary. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I wanted to go back underwater for a second. Let's do it. Um, Let's go so usually, usually when you think of like strong fish, you're thinking about the ocean, right? Like fish, like marlin and stuff like that. You see the fishermen that are like, there's like three guys trying to pull on the pole, like fishing behind a boat where there's just these. Yeah, you will think of that, a shark or a, um, the sail, mm-hmm, sailfish, mm-hmm. marlin. But sometimes, have you... Now this was like a Photoshop clip, but they had like the gigantic um, rays in the Mekong where they got the the huge gigantic rays. And I would see the thumbnail on occasion on YouTube where they've got, you know, it in a little tiny pond making it seem like the ray is as big as, but there are some pretty strong animals that can be in some pretty shallow ponds on occasion. Just take a look at this fisherman's experience. Apparently he's being pulled under, under a, this is like the worst fishing technique I've ever seen in my life. He's got a no stick. No kidding. Like, this is I, bad. I mean, this thing must be like, I mean, look at this. I mean, and this is a local park, but what did they put in this pond? Oh, wait. No, no, it's just, you know, it's a regular size fish, and this guy just doesn't know how to fish. <laughs> <laughs> he may have gotten caught on the, on the, um, that <laughs> tree. He goes, he can literally. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this guy is like insane. I think what got me confused was there was another fish. Uh, I mean, first off, how, how did you end up in the water to begin with? It's like a local park pond. You should be on the shore. That's too much dedication. That's just too much dedication. I think it's stupidity. This isn't dedication. <laughs> this is just worst fishing technique ever. <laughs> <laughs> that's hilarious i love it that's hilarious oh man I, I think sometimes it's just yeah your technique is just bad <laughs> it's just bad but there's some fish in the amazon that are oh what was the kind Piri, um, pirikuru i think is the name of the fish and um is a very ancient, gigantic fish, and the fishermen will take advantage of the fact that the fish had to go out and take a, a breath every couple of every several minutes. So okay. they will wait for the fish to come out uh, to breathe. And it looked prehistoric, almost. I forgot the name of another fish anyway, but it looked prehistoric. Okay. Very prehistoric. Mm-hmm. So, so basically, yeah. since you can't think of the name of the fish, and we're not describing it no, very well. Cool. Kirikuru is the name of the fish. Okay. I just can't think of the other fish that looks like it, so I can give you a, a visual uh, comparison. Okay, okay. Uh, which right. one is the fish they use? Uh, um, caviar. What fish like, is that? I want to say beluga, but that's not it because it's beluga caviar, but it's not from like a beluga whale. Um, it's like a sturgeon or something like that, I believe. Sturgeon, not, like a sturgeon. Ever, it looks like a sturgeon. Yeah. Okay. Like, but but very dark skin and humongous, and it looks very prehistoric. Is what yeah. this pirikuru looks like. Thank you. <laughs> and I can't picture a sturgeon, so it didn't really help me, but I'm sure it helped <laughs> other people. <laughs> Think of a fish that almost looks like a like a mixture between a barracuda with the dark skin and a funky. I, like, I have I have a better way of doing this, guys. What we're gonna do is we're gonna find a photo of it for you. Since I'm not going to go look it up right now, and we will uh, we'll put it in the social media posts for the community <laughs> posts. So um, if you guys don't know every show, basically when we bring up hypothetical questions, which I love doing, today was more a little more informational and fact stuff. So this is this is fun too. Uh, sometimes we like to do the uh, the fun hypotheticals though. Um, but if we talk about anything or we bring up questions or, or photos or stuff we don't have on hand because we can't find everything at least not at that exact moment. Um, We're going to put them all on the community posts. So, and we're going to have a thread at Facebook and Twitter and 
YouTube mm-hmm. has a community section. There's a free section at Patreon. You guys can go see. You don't have to sign up for anything. Um, but we're going to post a lot of that stuff that we talk about there. And hopefully it starts some conversations and we can have some fun with it. And then you know what you said something about it. That way I can have a pretty good picture. Yeah, I just, we don't ever like, there's always stuff I want to go find, but it's like, I don't, I can do it, but then I have to do this for two minutes on my other screen while I'm looking to go find the animals. And I just don't see, this is just not my good side. So I don't know. Just, <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, to the other side. Oh, okay. <laughs> that side isn't any better. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think this is this is the side most most of you right, guys right. way better than this side or that but side. But then it ends up a little more fun too, because then people can kind of make comments and get conversations going. Guys, please leave comments. Get in there and and we have a lot of discussions and stuff. And sometimes we ask very specific questions. We were talking the other day about uh uh what was the dog that we hadn't had? Neither of us. I no, a border collie. You're talking yeah, about border, border collie. collie. Neither of us had ever really had much experience with border collies. So we were curious what it was like to live with a border collie as a pet and stuff like that. So sometimes the questions are really specific. Sometimes they're general. But the whole point fun for us is to get the community talking, get everybody interacting, because that's why we're here. Like I've said before, Maria and I can watch video clips and talk about animals for four hours amongst ourselves. We wouldn't need to do a podcast about it. But the fun part is getting the community together and building that and everybody talking, swapping information, swapping hacks and stuff is really fun about what some people do, cutting up old shirts and tying them in knots for their cats to play with. And and there's just so many good pieces of information that other people have, stuff they've done um, as far as getting rid of pests and stuff like that. So that's the fun part for us. We want to interact as much as, uh, as anything else. Like we do the show, but at the same time, we want to be part of the community that gets built. So we try to just give as many places as possible that you can do that. But yeah, you'll find photos and questions and all that stuff in, in those places. Um, you know what, Mar, we're at about like 50 something minutes at this point. Let's uh, let's round it out. What do you think? Should I we... think that's great. I had okay. a lot of fun. All right. mm-hmm. I hope you guys had a good time. We, we always have a, a good time doing the show and uh, we got a little, uh, little sidetracked in the middle, but that stuff's fun too. I'm sure not a lot of people have uh, vacationed Never. around. Yeah, and had some of these experiences. And again, if you've ever been somewhere where you kind of like you went on vacation and thought it was going to be something. And then once you got there, you're like, this is not what I expected at all. That would be fun. I love hearing stories like that. Some of my favorite photos are actually of like, have you ever seen like the pyramids? And then they take the shot, the not tourist photo of the pyramids in Egypt. If you take no, the like reverse the angle of the pyramids, there's like a massive neighborhood like right next to them. Yeah, like, there is. There is. Yeah. I see what you're saying. They're taking the picture from the city towards the desert. Yeah. But when they take it from the desert, it literally, you're right, it's right there. Yeah, you get so like, many. in the middle of nowhere. Uh-huh. But there's so many angles of shots that you're just like, oh, I thought it would be this from all the photos. And you see that like. Rea- you know, dream versus reality type stuff. And it's just those things are so interesting to me. It's like, oh, yeah. I used to go when I would travel, I'd actually stand in a place and turn on my camera and I would walk slowly 360 degrees specifically for that purpose because you usually Love only it. see it from one angle. And I wanted to get like what the whole experience was of that scene and that moment. So when I go back at it and look at it, I'd be able to see it. But so if you guys have any fun stories about stuff like that, where you went on vacation somewhere and it did not turn out the way that <laughs> it looked in the brochures, I would <laughs> love to hear them because those are just hilarious to me. <laughs> but thank you guys so much for joining us. We are going to head out and we will see you next time. Bye, guys. Thank you.